where we win our battles. It's in those moments of high praise and those moments of deep worship where the presence of God comes in and we begin to speak prophetically and we begin to decree statements of faith, that's where battles are won. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against those things. There are principalities and powers and the only way we can defeat them are by using the spiritual weapons that God has given us. And I just need to sometimes remind you of how dangerous your weapons are, how sharp your sword is how powerful your praise is. I'm gonna say what I said just a few minutes ago. I believe praise does some things. I believe praise invites and invokes the presence of God into your life and into every circumstance and situation. I believe praise causes the spirit of the Lord to move in power and to move freely in our lives and in our services. I believe praise still sets out ambushments against the enemy. I believe praise still causes walls, barriers, limitations, and boundaries to come crashing down. I believe praise is a powerful, powerful weapon. David's book, when he said, there's a bunch of people trying to kill me, and I'm scared to death, and I don't even want to live. I want to die, but nevertheless, shall I praise you and magnify your name? Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Saul trying to kill me, but I would desire to spend one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. Don't withhold your praise as a way of expressing your displeasure and your disappointment in what God hasn't yet done for you. Use the pain to run to his presence and use the hurt and the confusion to drive you to a place of exalting him and saying, no matter what I feel, no matter what I'm going through, you are still above everything else in my life. I will praise the Lord. Why don't you take seven seconds and put it into practice? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If praise is a good thing and it's a pleasant thing, then I think we ought to do it. No matter what we're feeling, no matter what we're facing, we ought to praise the Lord. Praise, the third thing that it tells us in this verse, is that praise is attractive. It's comely. In Isaiah 52, the prophet Isaiah gives an instruction to the people of Zion. He said, put on your strength and put on your beautiful garments. The fact that Isaiah had to tell them to put those things on leads me to believe that strength and beautiful garments will very rarely come onto you. You got to put them on. He said, you put them on. It's a decision you have to make. The choice is yours. The burden of responsibility lies on you. You got to choose to put on your strength and your beautiful garments. Now, some of you may have come to service today, coming straight from work or whatever, but Sunday morning is really our day to just get dressed up. You know, and some of us for dress, it's what I'm wearing tonight. Some of you maybe put on a sports coat. Some of you ladies wear a dress. But Sunday, when we come to church, we, we really try to dress cool. Do you know we do? We, we try to dress good, and we try to look our best. The old phrase is Sunday best. Are you all with me? Now, before you come to church on a Sunday morning, whether you are male or female, you go through your wardrobe, you go through your dresser drawers in your closet, and you try to find the right outfit. What's going to make me look good today? What am I in the mood to wear? I'm Ruth, and I got a dress to find my Boaz. You go through your stuff and you try to find the outfit that you're in the mood for and that's really going to make you feel comfortable and perhaps even self-confident. Well, some of us have been going through our spiritual wardrobe, our spiritual closet, spiritual dresser drawers, and we've been choosing clothes like sorrow and sadness, pity, the garment of heaviness, I just came to tell you that don't look good on you. Some stuff you just shouldn't wear. (laughs) Don't make me get on this. If you don't don't shout, I'm going to get on it. Because some things are not flattering on certain people. 
And pity don't look good on you. You don't look good in pity. You don't look good in sorrow. So in Jesus' name, put that junk back in the closet. Put it in the dresser drawer. Slam the door. Put it back in your wardrobe. And put on the strength and the beautiful garments that God has given you. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Because praise looks good on you. Praise is attractive. And you know, I've come to find that what you wear, like physically wear, attracts certain things to your life. There's times that I'll go out into public and I'll be totally unshaven. I know I have a beard, but it can get worse. <laughs> I'll be wearing a ball cap or some baggy shorts or something. I dress like that on purpose because I know if I go out like that and I'm wearing a ball cap, that ain't nobody from our church or from anywhere else that's ever seen me is going to know who I am. Now y'all going to be looking for me in a ball cap. I've walked right by people that I know and they don't recognize me because I'm not in my church apparel. But I can attract a lot of attention. If I came into a restaurant and y'all were eating there, you'd see me right away. Oh, that's pastor. Pastor came to eat. Maybe he'll pay our bill. <laughs> what you wear attracts certain things to your life. And I've gone into some nice department stores over the years, and I've gone into those stores sometimes wearing that kind of an outfit, baggy shorts and maybe some sweatpants, a tracksuit. And if I go into those nice department stores like that, I'll be fortunate if I get one, just one attendant that will come up to me and with contempt in their voice, can we help you, sir? Like I ain't even supposed to be there. But if I go into those same stores wearing me some smooth shoes and some nice clothes and a fancy watch, man, I get five or six of them. Can we help you, sir? Be an honor to serve you. Just let us know if we can help you pick anything up. They all over me. What you wear attracts things to your life. This is why I want you to know again that praise looks good on you. It's attractive on you. It causes things to want you and to pursue you. So put on your strength. Put on your beautiful garments. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Praise looks good on you. And I'm going to tell you in about five minutes as I get ready to close here why attracting things is so important and what your praise will get you to attract. But you've got to go to verse 2 and verse 3 with me to understand this. He talks about praise and then immediately a strict, harsh transition into a whole other subject. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the broken hearts. And he binds up their wounds. Let me just build on this for a minute. God is looking to develop his church, Jerusalem. He's looking to increase it. He's looking to develop it. He's looking to build it up. But he's looking for a certain type of people. And if y'all don't shout here, I'm going to come lay hands on you because you are these kind of people. He is not looking for the put together and the perfect. He's not looking for those that don't have emptiness or have need. He is looking for outcasts and broken up people. He's looking for the hopeless and the helpless, the lost and the dying, the hurting, and those that are in pain. God is looking for the outcast, and he's looking for the broken. He has an interest in that particular kind of person. This is the stone in which he chooses to build his church with. Nehemiah did not rebuild the walls of Jerusalem with brand new stones. Rather, he took the stones that had been burnt by fire and said, I'm going to take trash and turn it into a testimony. I'm going to take something that's burnt and make it a blessing. And God is looking for those who have been outcast, those who have been broken, those who have been rejected. Why is God interested in the broken? Why is he interested in the rejected? 
Because he wants to heal the brokenhearted. And he wants to bind up the wounds of those that are bleeding. Be no person for him to heal if they want nobody broken. Nobody for him to bind up the wounds if there wasn't a broken heart. So God is searching and he's seeking to establish a church and to build his church with people who are down and out, people who have struggled and broken. And you can be a multimillionaire and still be down and out. And you can be living in a box and be up and in. Don't have nothing to do with economic condition. It has to do with difficulty in life. It has to do with your broken heart, your broken dreams, an impossible sickness that you're facing. And God is here saying to you, I'm looking to build my church with outcasts and with the broken because I don't have anybody to heal if they ain't sick. I don't have anything to restore if nothing was left, lost. I'm looking to build up Jerusalem with the outcasts of Israel. Now, what does this have to do with praise and attraction? The psalm begins by talking to us about the importance of praise and the benefits of praise. It's good, it's pleasant, and it's attractive. Then a swift transition into talking about outcast and broken people. This leads me to believe that there is a correlation or a connection between the necessity and the importance of praise towards those who are outcast, rejected, and broken. It's as if God is saying through this psalm that if the outcast and the broken and the rejected would praise me, they will attract the healing of their broken heart. They will attract, I feel Jesus in here, they will attract the restoration of everything that has been taken and everything that has been lost. If they'll just put on the garment of praise, they will start attracting my power, my healing, my mercy, and my goodness and grace. If you praise me, you're going to attract some things to your life. Did I say I was closing? I got mixed reviews, so I'm going to go with the one that said no. God is looking for praise, specific praise, and I want to end. I promise I'll end here because this is the last chapter in Psalm. I have no further to go. <laughs> Y'all, we get started on Proverbs. We're going to be here a minute now. Psalm 150. I'm talking about specific praise. Psalm 150 verse 1 begins again with the instruction, the command, praise the Lord. Now, it tells you in Psalm 147 what the benefits of praise are. This tells you where to praise and why to praise. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Can I, can I talk a little bit about this? Every one of us needs to have a prayer life and a praise life that's outside of the church. In your car, I came in last Wednesday night and pulled up to somebody. I don't know who she was, a woman. And let me tell you something. She was praising God. <laughs> Kirk Franklin was bumping. And she was at the stoplight lost in the glory. I just drove by like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to have a prayer life and a praise life outside the church, at home. But you have to bring that private prayer life and that private praise life into the corporate setting of the house of God. Okay, okay. Let me explain it to you like this. If you would spend... And I, and I, I know we need to have fun. We, we should have fun. We enjoy things. My wife and I... Like movies, we like watching sports, we like listening to music sometimes from the 90s and music from the 60s. So we're not living up here in spiritual la la land, okay? But if you're feeding yourself a constant diet of secular things, this is why it takes the worship team 37 minutes on a Wednesday night before you start moving. I'm going to make you happy, I promise. If you spend all day watching news, 
You're going to want to pop Prozac before you come to church. And might need it with some of the stuff we see on TV. So you come in heavy because you haven't had any personal prayer or personal praise. So our ability to enter in quickly to the presence of God corporately is limited by the individual's inability to come in with the presence. You should bring the presence in with you so when we open up first song, bass drum hits, keyboard hits, glow. But instead, we have to shake off the heaviness of the day, the traffic of the day. The da -da 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 -da. We got to shake it all off. When I come to church, and I love doing it with my family, sometimes I need to do it by myself, but I love coming on Sunday mornings especially, man. We play in music. We're singing. We're praying. I'm not doing that just so I can preach. I'm doing it to teach my children that when you come to the house of God, you've got to start church before you get to church. So when we praise him in the sanctuary, we can add the second part of this verse, which says, and in the firmament of his power. Sometimes, and it doesn't happen very often here, but sometimes we never have that breakthrough in our praise or that moment of worship and you may sit and say well pastor was off today no I wasn't I pray too much to be off I study too hard to be off been doing this for 20 years I'm not off I may be a little bit more on some days over another. But, but the switch ain't ever flipped completely off. I at least got a little spark floating through the socket. Maybe it was the worship team was off. Maybe you were off. Maybe too many of you came dragging tail into this room, sad, despondent, and depressed, and it took 45 minutes just to make you feel like Jesus was alive. And we miss the moment to bring the firmament. What is the firmament? It's the hottest place of the fire. It's the most powerful, transforming place in the presence of God. And if we would bring our private prayer life, our private praise life into the sanctuary, we would instantly get to the firmament. And it's necessary. And I think you'll give me a witness here. I felt some amazing moves of God and felt the presence of God in my hotel rooms, in my living room, in my bedroom. I felt God in so many places. But there ain't nothing like what you feel when you're in the sanctuary. So I think you can feel his power at home, but the firmament is here. The firmament of his power is where? In his sanctuary. This is why we must never miss an opportunity to praise him as big, as loud, as good, and as with much abandon as we can because we need the fire to show up. We need the power to show up. We need miracles to show up. Praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. And praise him according to his excellent greatness. So you praise him for everything he's already done. And when he can't find any else, anything else that he has done to praise him for, you just praise him because he's good. Amen. His excellent greatness just says praise him because he's good. When things are bad, he's good. When you don't feel good, he's still good. Praise him. Verse 3, praise him with the sound of the trumpet and praise him with the psaltery and the harp, the timbrel and the dance. And praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Instruments are important. And some people traditionally have a problem with instruments. No one in our church, because if you did, you'd run out a long time ago. But instruments have been created by God. And they were created to praise God. Lucifer had every instrument ever created on the inside of him. And he was the praise and worship leader. I don't know where people get that in church you can only play an organ 
when he had every instrument on the inside of him, like God was offended, he created Lucifer with everything in him. The more instruments, the better. Because it's a way of expressing our praise to God. Praise him in the dance. And I'm going to end right here because I won't be able to get past this one. Everybody else has a different skill set when it comes to dancing. <laughs> Can we just have fun and just laugh at ourselves? Everybody has a different skill set when it comes to dancing. And everybody has a different level of comfortability when it comes to dancing. Now, some people that can dance, they don't have a problem dancing at a wedding or whatever, but when they come into church, they get tight. Well, maybe it's because they drunk at the wedding. I don't know. Get drunk here. We all bombed, so just get drunk with us. We drunk in the Holy Ghost every service around here, so just take a sip with us and dance. Have some fun. Some people, just no matter how great the move of God is and the presence of God is strong, they just, they can't, they can't let themselves go. And I'm just going to tell you as your pastor, I want to see more dancing in this church. I don't care if you dance like a wounded duck with a bad foot and a broken wing. Dance. Dance. <laughs> and maybe you smooth, dude. Maybe you got moved. Dance. I want to see more dancing because this is a way that we are to express our praise to God. For some of you who have never moved and danced, we are not expecting you to break out the Holy Ghost version of the electric slide this Sunday. But maybe just this. Start there. And then, then when you get that down, then you can start doing it forward and backwards. When you get real good, you can put them all together. Some of y'all could just stick your one leg up and go like this. Just do something. Move the shoulders. Do the matrix. Something. This temple was created to reflect the glory of God. Watch this. I'm trying to close. My watch ain't wound, but I'm trying to close. Have you ever saw the mountains glistening in the morning, the sunrise coming over them? Have you ever seen the beauty of leaves changing in the season called fall, which we don't have here? Have you ever seen the waves of the ocean cascading over one another, erupting over top of one another, splashing on the sea? Has anybody ever seen natural beauty or seen a rose begin to open? We have these rose bushes in our backyard, and I, I sit out every morning and drink my coffee, and I see these roses as the sun gets brighter. They're closed in the morning, but I see them opening as the sun comes up right before my very eyes. Has anybody ever seen something like that and said, Man, God is good. Nature reflects his glory. The beauty of it reflects his beauty. And I think you need to understand that when you dance, even though you may have two club feet, when you dance, you're like that rose in the morning, opening up and showing the glory and the goodness of your creator. So dance, so praise him, magnify him. It's one of the ways we reflect the beauty of our creator. We got to dance. Let everything that has breath. Young, old, rich, poor, black, white, brown, or stuck in between. 
whether you're A personality, B personality, or you are in your own category called the F and G personality, I don't know what category, to, praise him. Everything that has breath. If you're breathing, you are borrowing his breath. And when you release that breath, you are acknowledging to him, I'm being a good steward with what you lent to me. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The good times, the bad times, and the in-between. Because praise looks good on you, and it attracts things to your life. Favor, blessing, restoration, healing, God's goodness, mercy, and grace. Praise attracts those things to your life. So New Beginnings, why don't you get up on your feet and let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Come on, let everything, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Y'all ain't shouting big enough. You're not clapping loud enough. Let everything that has breath Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. For a donation of $20 or more, we would like to thank you by sending you Pastor Jonathan's three-part series, Light. Just visit our website and click the Donate Now link. Thank you for your support.